Welcome to week 9 of Introduction to Linguistics. This week we return to the topic of sociolinguistics, or the relationship between language and society. And we're going to try to answer a question. Why do we see variation in language? Why do people speak in different ways or use different words? In this video, we're going to focus on geographical variation of language. And as we go through the week, we will look at other sources of language variation. So we have two main types of variation. On week eight, we talked about how languages change through time. We're going to call that diachronic variation. This week, we're going to talk about synchronic variation, which is variation at one point in time, for example, the present. So if we look at English from the present, we will see that there's many different dialects for English and there's different words that people use. This is the type of variation that we'll be study, studying this week, synchronic variation. And as we look at examples, we're going to try to figure out why we have variation. Why do people speak in different ways? And we've been hinting at a hypothesis all throughout the class. It's because people want to project an identity. They want to project a persona of who they are. And they do it because they want to identify with certain human groups, with your friends from 12A, for example, and no, not those people from 12B. Um, we do this by, again, projecting a certain persona because certain words or expressions can index a certain identity. Over the course of the week, we'll look at how uh, the research developed to come to this idea. And this will take us to some amazing places. And the, and the first place where it will take us is across the USA. So how do you pronounce the word water? Let me show you how people across the US pronounce it. Water. 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 So all of them are speaking some theoretical object that we call English. But in reality, they all have very different sounds. It's all uh, different varieties of English. There's not a single one across the country. Let me show you a specific example. How do you say, what do you call a sweetened carbonated beverage? What is your generic term for a sweetened carbonated beverage? Uh, well, that's the soda. Soda. Pop. Coke. Yep. So depending on when you, on where you grew up, uh, we could probably predict what word will you use. If you grew up in one of the areas marked in red, you will probably not uh, not a hundred percent sure, but probably use the word soda for that kind of drink. If you grew up in the areas in blue, you will probably say the word pop. And if you grew up in the areas in green, you will probably call it a Coke. And by the way, we get these maps by doing online polls where we ask people how they say words. We get them by calling people on the phone. In the 1800s, there were people who went on bikes across France and Germany asking people, how do you say this? How do you say that? And that's how we got dialectal maps. So you would have some thousands of data points that tell you that people in this region tend to call that beverage a pop, and people here tend to call it a Coke. Once you know that, you could trace a, a line that roughly separates the people who call it a Coke from the people who call it something else, for example, a pop or a soda. And again, this would be a just a very rough line. But on one side of this line, you would have places like Mississippi and Louisiana. And on the other side of the line, you would have places like Nebraska and Iowa. So we call this line an isogloss. An isogloss is a line that separates one uh, form of a word from another. So this isogloss separates the people that call it a Coke from the people that call it something else, for example. This is an isogloss. It means same word. Let's look at more maps of the US. So here we have our isogloss separating Coke from other words. This map here 
indicates how you pronounce this word, the, the candy, the toffee. So some people use two syllables for it, caramel. They are in the area in red. Some people use three syllables for it, caramel. Then they are in the area in blue. You can see that again, places like Mississippi and Louisiana are on one side and Nebraska is on the other side of this isogloss, a line separating the two syllable variant from the three syllable variant. Let's look at a third isogloss. Here's a map of how people use, say the second word, um, second uh, person plural. The red area have you guys and the green area has y'all. So you can see that we could trace an isogloss separating y'all from you guys from other regions. And the isogloss again would put Mississippi and Louisiana on one side and Nebraska on the other. This is a bundle of isoglosses. As you can see, they're not exactly the same, but they run through similar places. For example, um, Mississippi and Louisiana are always on one side of this bundle of isoglosses. When you have a bundle of these, of these regional features, we could say that we have a dialect on one side versus the other. So the Southern dialect of American English has some common features. For example, calling it a Coke, saying caramel with three syllables, and saying y'all. The collection of these features are what helps you draw the isoglosses to define the, ge uh, the geographic extension of the dialect and would help you uh, identify someone as, speak as uh, speaking Southern American English from other dialects. Um, this happens to every human language. This is, for example, a map of England, uh, Britain, and you can see a variable here, which is how people pronounce this number. Some people call it a three, but some people call it free. If it's yellow, it's more towards the TH, the interdental, and if it's purple, it's more the F. You can see that in the 1950s, uh, only a few people around London you know, said free with an F. So there was a very clear isogloss separating the southern region of uh, England versus, for example, the center and the north. However, this uh, form has extended in the 21st century. So now the line of the isogloss has moved upwards to the north. It is no longer a reliable marker of London versus everything else, but it is still a marker of southern England versus the northern parts of Britain. This is an example of an isogloss in Japanese. What do you call this delicious food here? Th this is the central island and the southern island of Japan, and if you're from this region, you're going to call this sushi. But if you're from the northern part of the central island, you will call it Sisi. They merged these two vowels into a more centralized vowel, Sisi. So there's an isogloss here that marks uh, where people call it, call it Sisi and where people call it Sushi. This is uh, one isogloss amongst many that separates this dialect, the Tohoku dialect, from the other dialects of Japanese. So this is one isogloss and there's many others that uh, I'm not showing you here, but that clearly separate one dialect from another. A bundle of isoglosses separates a, a dialect from another. It's a good moment to recap from week seven that all humans speak a dialect of their language. All humans have an accent. Uh, if you feel you don't have an accent, it's just because you're so used to it. But everyone has an accent uh, uh, because everyone speaks a dialect of English uh, or whichever your native language is. And nobody speaks the default or standard English. As we saw in week seven, there might be a group in your society that makes the claim that their dialect is the standard one. But this claim is based on economic power or political power, not on any linguistic or structural arguments. Moreover, the people who make those claims also tend to make claims like saying that their way of speaking is more logical or even more beautiful. And these claims are unfounded. They tell you more about the power structure of society, about who gets to call their, their dialect better, than anything structural. As we've seen throughout the class, 
every dialect of a human language is incredibly complex and amazing from its phonological rules to its syntax. So there's no dialect that is better or more logical or more beautiful than any other. Um, so yeah, these kinds of claims tell you more about the power structure in a society than about anything structural. In summary, human languages have variation. One of the sources of the variation is geographical. If you have two groups that don't tend to communicate very much with one another, each one of them is going to develop their own quirks, their own features, and therefore become separated. We could draw a line between them that separates the features from A and B, and this would be an isogloss. And if we have many different features with many isoglosses, then we could say that they're different dialects of a language. And these dialects, of course, are equally valid and they're just different because they're separated geographically. There's nothing that makes one better than the other, other than politics, not linguistic structure. 